near the end of 2 AD. Tiberius Claudius Nero was finally permitted to return to Rome after a seven-year exile on the island of Rhodes. And for that, he was thankful to his mother, Livia Drusilla, and his stepson, Gaius Caesar. But it was his wife Julia, the daughter of Augustus, whose political scheming had driven him to his act of defiance. Even so, what began as a happy retreat, an opportunity to pursue knowledge among the learned men of Greece, soon gave way to dread, fear, and paranoia. It was in 3 BC, when Eulus Antonius had served as proconsul of Anatolia, that Tiberius had first become aware there was talk of his assassination. Rumor had it that Eulus Antonius had coordinated with his niece, the Queen of Pontus and Cappadocia, to involve a Hasmonean son of King Herod of Judea. It was time for Tiberius to return to Rome. But Augustus refused. Then, the following year, Eulus Antonius was dead, condemned by Caesar Augustus as having designs on power. And five of King Herod's Hasmonean grandchildren were sent to Rome to be reared and educated as royal hostages by Tiberius' sister-in-law, Antonia. Tiberius's wife Julia was accused of having prostituted herself to many on the very rostra where her father had passed Rome's laws against adultery, and she was promptly exiled to the island of Pandateria. But, before banishing his daughter Julia from Rome, Caesar Augustus thought to deprive his son-in-law, Tiberius, of any opportunity to alter his plans for succession. The divorce of Julia and Tiberius was formalized by Caesar Augustus, ensuring power would pass directly to his grandsons, Gaius and Lucius, without the possibility of a Claudian regency in the interim. And still, Tiberius was not allowed to leave Rhodes. As he remained in this land of peril, even more transparent death threats now emerged from those who surrounded Gaius Caesar in his role as the political voice and military arm of Augustus, regarding Armenia's revolt. Yet, despite sharing with his stepfather, Augustus, the revelation that he had been threatened with beheading, the pleas of Tiberius seemed to fall on deaf ears. It was a wake-up call, his sudden death would certainly bring a quick resolution to the dynastic problems of Caesar Augustus. And with the protection of his tribunician powers about to expire, invisibility was about to become his new refuge. Life on roads changed dramatically for a Tiberius who now moved inland and did his best to blend in with the locals. Then came the mysterious death of the younger brother of Gaius, and stepson of Tiberius, Lucius Caesar. The sudden death of Lucius in the city of Massilia coincided with the great success of Gaius Caesar in bringing Parthia's King Fratuses to the negotiating table and convincing the young king to withdraw his support from Armenia's rebellion. And then, Tiberius was recalled to Rome, now that his status was but that of a private citizen. In seven years' time, Rome had changed. Tiberius didn't recognize this city, whose streets were filled with angry protesters still denouncing Julia's banishment to Pandateria some three years after the fact, still seeking justice on her behalf by throwing burning torches and flaming trash into the Tiber River. The populists were clearly feeling disenfranchised by the exiles of so many Cornelians, including Julia and her mother. Rome's Praetorian Guard had also changed. Caesar Augustus had installed two Praetorian prefects, where the Praetorians had previously answered to a single prefect, who answered only to Caesar Augustus. This change took place in the same year that Eulus Antonius had committed suicide and Julia had been exiled. 
It was at that time that Augustus had immediately dismissed Salvius Sapa as Praetorian Prefect, replacing him with Quintus Astorius Scapula and Lucius Saius Strabo, the father of Ilius Sejanus, the Praetorian guard who had accompanied Gaius Caesar to the east. But, as a private citizen, Rome's political health and Praetorian security were no longer Tiberius's priorities. Most important to the returned exile was renewing his fractured relationship with his son, Drusus. When Tiberius had departed Rome in 6 BC, the 11-year-old Drusus had gone to live with his mother, Vipsania, and her new husband, Gaius Asinius Gallus. By the time Tiberius had returned from Rhodes at the end of 2 AD, Drusus was 18 years old, an adult son whom Tiberius barely knew, raised in the household of his stepfather, along with six brothers and a sister or two. Then Gaius Caesar's campaign in the east took an unexpected turn. His grandfather Augustus had set him up for success at every turn. Yet Armenia's revolt continued. Gaius Caesar was unexpectedly forced to march his legions to Artagira and lay siege to the city. Deceived into attending what he thought to be the prelude to the Armenian rebels' surrender, Gaius was ambushed and stabbed in the shoulder. Although he was rescued by his men and finally took the city of Artagira, Gaius Caesar's health continued to deteriorate over the next four months. By February 21st of the 4 AD year, Gaius Caesar, like his younger brother, Lucius Caesar, was dead. Tiberius was summoned to stand before his grieving stepfather, Caesar Augustus. In his never-ending struggle to make certain that his death could not immediately ignite civil war, Caesar Augustus, now bereft of his grandsons and heirs, was forced once again to alter the succession. Amidst a flurry of internal arrangements and political marriage alliances, Tiberius was once again given the tribunician powers, making him the equal of Augustus in government. But this time, more was needed. Tiberius had to be adopted by Caesar Augustus. Unlike the Tribunicia Potestas bestowed on him in 6 BC, which had been granted under the name Tiberius Claudius Nero, his Tribunician powers of 4 AD would be bestowed on Tiberius Julius Caesar. But that was not the only requirement. Beyond forcing Tiberius to change his name to Caesar, he was also forced to adopt, as his primary heir, his late brother's Claudian son. Tiberius's own son had previously been displaced as Tiberius's heir by Gaius and Lucius Caesar. Now, once again, Drusus must be displaced by his own cousin, Germanicus. Germanicus whose name became Germanicus Julius Caesar, was then wed to Julia Vipsania Agrippina, the younger sister of Gaius and Lucius, and the biological granddaughter of Caesar Augustus. Germanicus's sister, the newly widowed Claudian, Livilla, returned to Rome after the death of Gaius Caesar, and was quickly remarried to Tiberius's natural son, whose name now became Drusus Julius Caesar. By arranging these marriage alliances between his own descendants and those of his Claudian wife, Livia Drusilla, Caesar Augustus had guaranteed the line of succession for a full three generations. After his death, command of Rome's legions would pass to Tiberius Julius Caesar. After Tiberius, it would pass directly to Germanicus Julius Caesar. And through Germanicus's wife, Julia Vipsania, his own biological great-grandson would not only be born with the name Caesar, he would eventually sit at the head of Rome's legions. Tiberius had feared for his own life long enough to more than glimpse the political realities of power. 
he'd come to appreciate the caution and profound vision that had inspired his stepfather Augustus. Now a 66-year-old politically isolated man, surrounded by Claudians, to engineer a plan to eventually reclaim the power that had somehow slipped from his family's grasp. A daughter in exile, his grandsons, both dead, but his own death would not stop him. His descendants would continue to do his bidding. Ilius Sejanus, Sulpicius Quirinius, Velius Bertuculus, and even Gaius Caesar's wife, Livilla, were all partisans of the Claudians. How many of those Claudian men had accompanied Gaius Caesar into the city of Artagira, where he had been suddenly ambushed and stabbed? And just who had tended to the wounded Gaius afterwards? A wound which never seemed to heal, eventually driving Gaius mad, before claiming his life. In the span of eight years, Tiberius had bounced from top man in Rome, to hunted exile, to adopted son and primary heir of Caesar Augustus. At the same time, Tiberius's mother, Livia Drusilla, continued to support the right men for Rome's Senate, discreetly diminishing the Senate's populist members in favor of more conservative members. She also supported Lucius Caius Strabo as one of the Praetorian prefects, and Tiberius's sister-in-law, Antonia, the daughter of Marcus Antonius, who now had oversight of five of King Herod's Hasmonean grandchildren, had somehow managed to win the highest foremost marriage within Rome's hierarchy, guaranteeing that her son would one day become Rome's imperator. But Caesar Augustus had one more surprise for Tiberius. While he was arranging that Tiberius be adopted and made heir to Augustus's name and power, another adoption took place. Once again, Caesar Augustus had spawned instant political rivalry, as once existed between Tiberius and Gaius Caesar, the biological son of Marcus Agrippa. This time, Caesar Augustus had adopted the 15-year-old Agrippa Posthumus, his last grandson and yet another son, of Marcus Agrippa.